is time. It is time. They can't be like Packers. No. Are you crazy? Welcome to Packernet. My name is JJ Leahy, and we are going to talk today about Jeff Halfley. But you're not going to hear it from me. Uh, I have two experts who are going to come in. Uh, one is a, a longtime Ohio State reporter. Uh, you have met him before if you've been listening to me podcasting here on the Packernet Podcast Network for a number of years. Uh, and we're going to get his perspective on Jeff Halfley's time there. And we're going to immediately transition then and hear from a Boston College reporter. And uh, I think it'll be nice to put together sort of this linear timeline of the last five years for Jeff Havley and examine scheme, examine his personality, tendencies, that kind of stuff. We're going to address some misconceptions, misconceptions that are out there. And one of the things we're going to do as we talk to these two uh, really intelligent gentlemen is we're going to reference a couple of videos. And so I'm going to play those here for you first before we hop into the interview so that when um, we're referencing them and then at one point I'm going to um, like totally mangle a Richard Sherman quote, you're going to have sat here and, and watched it for yourself and so you'll have that context. Um, and so uh, hopefully you enjoy these. And the other thing that I will say, so I'm going to play a couple of videos for you here. Um, when you're done listening to Nathan and Mitch and they're very smart um, guys with a lot of insight. I want you to go find um, an episode of uh, Clayton Bailey's live stream that he did with, and I'll put a link down in the description below that he did with um, coach uh, Chris, Chris Hadded. And I apologize. Um, I'm probably mangling his last name talking about some film stuff with, uh, with Coach Halfley. Um, in particular, the idea of the timing step that Jeff Halfley teaches his cornerbacks. So go listen to that. You'll enjoy it a lot, and you'll learn a lot. Like I said, I'm going to drop the link to that down in the description below. Um, if you are listening to this episode on Spotify, Spotify or, or um, Apple Podcasts or whatever, there is a video version of it. So you can go find that on Twitter and I believe on YouTube as well um, at Packernet Podcast. So go check those out. And I think that'll do it. So we're going to hop into uh, these couple clips here and then we're going to hear from Nathan Baird uh, from Buckeye Talk, a production of Cleveland.com. Nathan covers Ohio State football. Going back to Halfley, now you had a full season to work with him, get to know him, how he operates. Uh, what has impressed you uh, about him? His preparation is, is is some of the best I've seen. You know, I've had some great defensive back coaches, some great defensive coaches, defensive minds, um, and he's right up there. He's with his preparation and how he breaks down film and how easy and simple he makes the game plan sound and how easy he makes it for guys to understand. Like, he paints a a very vivid picture of, of what you're going to see. And, and it's all about executing. Like I've, I've tried to explain to you guys over and over, like they, they give us the plays a lot of times. A lot of times they prepare us really well. You mentioned your, uh, you know, kind of what you believe in on defense. What, what is that? If someone says, what is the Coach Halfley defense, what, how do you describe it? We've been more middle closed defense with a safety in the middle of the field than probably most people in college football. Yeah. Um, most people are some type of too high quarter space, and I get it for the quarterback run game. So mm -hmm. we've had to kind of trend in that direction as well. But I've, I've done a lot. I've done a lot, at least a starting point with the middle close with four down linemen. Um, very similar to what we did in San Francisco and Ohio State. A lot of people are doing it in the NFL. Um, but I've started to adapt and create different one high shells, which really play like two high shells and get extra guys in the box. Yeah. You just got to stop the quarterback run game. So it's yeah. a different, it's almost when I talk to my friends in the NFL and we talk defense together, it's almost a different game. Yeah. I mean, cause the quarterback in the NFL, they're going to run it in big moments or in the red zone or on third down yeah. or in a championship game. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that week in and week out. Yeah. And you got to account for an extra guy. Yeah. So you got to change. Yeah. Um, and those are, and then you can go, I, I joke sometimes 
unbalanced. It's you can't do that in the NFL. It's like yeah. we're defending unbalanced formations. There's a field and a boundary yeah. in college football where in the NFL the ball's in the middle of the field the whole game. Yeah. It's a different game. Yeah. Um and it's been fun to to follow it. And it's appreciated. And, and I gotta think too, I gotta thank Ryan Day and the staff we have. Uh, Greg Madison, like Joe was saying, Greg Madison should be next to me here. We did this together. Al Washington, Larry Johnson, Matt Barnes. Um, we got a really good staff and we have really good players. And, and players, really, honestly, they make us pretty good. And we have really good players. We have a great head coach and we have a great university. And um, I was in the NFL the last seven years. And I never thought I'd come back to coaching college football. I didn't. I wanted to be a coordinator. I wanted to be an NFL head coach. Something brought me back. And... It's the best decision I ever made because we won a lot of games. We played really good defense. But the best story that I could share with you was we beat Nebraska. And um, one of my players had two interceptions or three interceptions. And he stood up in front of the group and he said, Jeff Halfway changed my life. And that's why we do what we do. Th this is nice, guys. It is. You know, going to the playoffs, it's great. But we change lives. And that's, there's so much honor in that. And... To be able to take an 18 and 19 year old and change his life and help him down the road for his life, that's what it's all about. All right, joining us to talk about Jeff Apley's time at Ohio State, Nathan Baird. Uh, he is one of my favorite football podcasters out there, host of the Daily Buckeye Talk podcast, and he's the lead Ohio State beat reporter for Cleveland.com. Nathan, welcome back to the show. We appreciated having you on here on the Packernet Podcast Network about a year ago to talk about draft prospects from Ohio State. Yeah, how's it going? Good to be back. Really loved your time last year um, and uh, excited that we have an opportunity to bring you back on here. This time we're going to be talking about Jeff Halfley. Um, now, you joined Cleveland.com and the Buckeye Talk podcast, I believe, in 2019, right? Yeah, uh, uh, August 2019. So uh, right before, uh, about two weeks before the first game. So in, in 2018, OSU's defense was pretty bad. And what team were you covering no. in 2018? <laughs> uh, well, it, it was historically bad in 2018. The team I was covering in 2018 was, it was actually primarily Purdue basketball, but I was helping cover Purdue football. And people may remember that year, uh, Ohio State came to Purdue, was ranked, I think, number two in the country at the time. And Purdue beat them something like, uh, people at Purdue certainly remember the score because they bring it up a lot. It was 45 to 24, something like that. It just just blew them out of the, the water. And that was part of the indication of just how bad that defense was for Ohio State. There were some injury things that were involved, but there were also some schematic problems. Again, people who were covering that team could, could go into that more in depth than I can, but definitely some schematic things, and that's why they had to make some changes. There weren't a lot of retention, wasn't a lot of retention of the outgoing uh, defensive staff when Ryan Day took over. In fact, Larry Johnson, who people know, uh, who people may know, a long, long, long time college football defensive line coach was the only one that they kept and, and everybody else had to come in from outside. Our audience uh, here at Packernet has like no familiarity with Ohio State at all. I'm a big time Ohio State fan, um, but there's a lot about how Ohio State does business that is very foreign to our audience here. One of those big things is that OSU seems like they frequently have co-coordinators at a lot of different um, you know, junctures over the last few years. Let's talk about the Greg Madison, Jeff Halfley pairing. Uh, how much weight should we give to the importance of those co-coordinator titles? And like, what, what was their dynamic like what was the influence that greg madison had on that defense you know it worked out really well it was a version of what ohio state has been doing on offense or at least did on offense for the first uh, three or four seasons under ryan day which is where you had kevin wilson the former iu head coach was technically the offensive coordinator coordinator even though ryan day was calling plays and a similar dynamic was kind of playing there on defense you know jeff halfley was a young coach still at the time a, a young coordinator you know he's actually about a year younger than me i think so people i don't know if people will be watching this video but i'm not that old so it tells you how how old he is i think he's 44 now or just 44 about sounds to, right turning 45 this spring i think so 
by putting him, you know, giving him that opportunity to be a coordinator, I believe for the first time, but then pairing him with someone like Madison, who was so much more veteran, had had been around a lot more things, allowed them to kind of balance things out. And it gave Halfley someone that he could turn to and be just having that sort of the wisdom that comes with those years of experience. Right. And he was still the one calling the defense on game days. So Halfley that's was. the Halfley was. Yeah. So that's the most important part of that. But I think that that was the way Ryan Day set that up. You could sort of build these tiers in here where you had both on offense and defense, you had some younger guys and some older guys, and you were just trying to balance that mix out. Yeah, believe it or not, there's actually a, a good bit of consternation among Packers fans right now over whether Halfley was the play caller at Ohio State. So it's nice to hear you um, speak from you know firsthand knowledge that that was a thing. Um, would you say that this was Jeff Halfley's defense or – is it more fair to say, like, well, they really were co-coordinators, and it was both of them, and it was both of their shared success? Or was this really Jeff Halfley's defense with Matt Madison there as, like, you know, almost like the NFL equivalent, you know, like the assistant head coach title that you're just helping uh, Jeff Halfley out, you know, in the, the veteran capacity? I think there was a, a share there in terms of probably, you know, building a game plan each week. But th the true answer there is, is a little bit more nuanced. It goes back beyond to even, I would call it Ryan Day's defense in some ways. But let me explain what I'm saying there because I don't want to lead your, your, your listeners in the wrong way. So Day and Halfley worked together with the 49ers right the, before. the head coach of Ohio. Ryan Day, yeah, I'm sorry. Ryan Day, the head coach, had worked together with the 49ers before um, for just like not that long, I think. Maybe they only overlapped one year on Chip Kelly's staff. Um, and I think that's the only time they worked together. I can't remember off the top of my head. I know it is, yeah. But they, they, they had a history together. Um, Ryan Day was familiar with him. They had made a connection to the point where – being, again, younger coaches, you start having conversations about like, well, someday when I'm a head coach, this is how I want my staff to be, and this is the kind of defense I want to run. And for Day, he came here to Ohio State a believer in running a like a cover one, like a single high safety defense. And that's what he wanted run here, and it took some – a couple years into it, uh, some failures and hiring Jim Knowles to come in as a defensive coordinator and just fully turning things over to him to kind of get them away from that system. But as far as for 2019, when he brought Jeff Halfley in, he wanted, like Ryan Day said, this is the defense that I want. I want to be running a single high safety defense. And it worked perfectly for Ohio State that year, partially because you can go back and look at that defensive alignment. You had Jeff Okuda, who I know things have not gone great for him in the NFL, but he was the number three overall pick in the draft, and it was for a reason because he was an excellent mm -hmm. cornerback in college. Uh, All-American, like unanimous All-American, I think, after that third year. On the other side, you had Damon Arnett, who things have gone even worse for in the NFL. In fact, he's not even in the NFL anymore for some personal reasons, but he was a first-round draft pick of the Raiders coming out of that year. And then the guy who was their, what they were calling then a slot cornerback, and they've called this position, any, it seems like every year they come up with a new name for it, but the, the nickel in what you'd call in a lot of defenses was this guy, Sean Wade, who fell to the fifth round when he finally came out, but he was a five-star, like major prospect coming out of high school. And that year, he was tremendous. He was a great fit as someone with the cornerback quickness, but also the willingness and the ability to come up and play the run in a heavy way. So they had a great setup. Oh, and I'm sorry, top of all that, you had a guy named Jordan Fuller, who, yeah. uh, who Jeff Halfley referred to as the eraser, and who was kind of a forgotten guy. Like I think he fell all the way to the... It was either the sixth round or the seventh round. I think I think he was sixth round uh, to the Rams, but then like immediately became a big part of a big leader on their defense of some pretty good teams, obviously that they've had the last couple of years. And that was the high safe. That was the free safety in that defense. So it was just a perfect setup, really, f for that year to play that defense. And then of course you had Chase Young up front, make causing quarterbacks all sorts of problems, which also helps the secondary. So it was a it was a very fortuitous mix, I think, of 
some better schematic ideas coming in and being taught better. And that's not just Halfley. That was, I think, you know, other assistant coaches came in at the same time, had some success there. It was also just a perfect time personnel wise. You know, the previous year when they were so bad, Nick Bosa was on that team, but he got hurt three games in, was done for the year. Chase Young was playing with like two sprained ankles most of the year. Their middle, uh, Mike linebacker, Tough Borland, who was a big captain for that team for multiple years, he was playing through injury. Multiple guys were hurt. It contributed to how bad they were. And the next year, you had all that group healthy. F- together you had chase young having this exceptional year and you had it feeding into this secondary that was really primed for something but that was the other half of what halfley did was yes he came in and and took this structure that day wanted and that plenty of teams have have used to success but he was also a secondary coach with that team so he was getting he was helping guys like okuda and arnett and sean wade take things up to the next level of in terms of their own play. They all had their best seasons of their career under him. And Sean Wade Absolutely. even was there for another year. Like coming out of that year, everyone looked at Sean Wade and was like, oh, this guy's going to be another first round pick, right? Well, then he moved to outside corner the next year, had a very uneven year in the COVID year and ended up falling to the fifth round. And I think the absence of Halfley's influence there might have been part of the equation. Yeah, you bring up a great point. If you look at uh, the PFF grades by season for every one of those players on the defense, they got a spike here. It's like, you know, 50, yep. 60, 90, 70, 50, 60, 88, 60. Like every single one of them, 2019 is the year, career best year for them. It's, it's like very obvious and in your face when you go look at it that way. It, and now again, there was some, you know, the old adage of how a, a defense can work sort of, you know, in a circular way. That defensive line was pretty great. I mean, Chase Young on one end, Jonathan Cooper, who people now are seeing play a very good outside linebacker for the the Broncos was uh, the other starting defensive end. A guy named Tyreek Smith that got drafted was in the mix. A guy named Zach Harrison, who was a third round pick last year. The Falcons was in the mix. At tackles, you had Davon Hamilton, who's been a good player for the Jaguars now for a couple years and was a mid-round pick. Jay Sean Cornell was a late-round pick of the Vikings, or the Lions, I'm sorry, but has had some NFL time. I mean, it was a very good defensive front and a obviously very talented secondary, and those two things worked well in sync together. And I thought Halfley did a good job of, of – helping that happen and like helping facilitate that. It just always helps when you can just put Chase Young out there and say, go get your 16 and a half sacks and, and not have to worry about uh, being as aggressive in your pass rush. It helped you help them be an elite defense. They were, they were, they were tremendous defense out here. So obviously we're going to give hundred percent of the credit to all the players, but on the coaching side, if we're going to get, if you know, assign a send uh, percentages, just trying to get to the, you know, bottom of the co DC title thing. If you're going to assign coaching uh, credit and a percentage, you know, what percentage would you give to Halfley versus Madison versus Ryan day? Uh, I mean, I think the preponderance of it, I would give to Halfley. I mean, again, day was the one who wanted that defense, but he, picked Halfley for a reason to be the guy to go in and execute it. And I think he saw in Halfley the things that have, have come to fruition. And I don't think he thought that Halfley would leave. Out. In fact, I know he didn't. He didn't expect Halfley to leave after one year. He thought that Halfley would come in and be the guy that he sort of built something with at Ohio State. And that Halfley already had some innate qualities that could make him a good head coach at the next level. But he thought that that was, or even at the same level, you know, in, in, in a college game. But he thought that that was maybe still going to be a couple years away. And then just the dominoes fell in such a way that it was a job that made some sense, a lot of sense for Halfley at the time. So I would still give Halfley a lot of credit though, for again, somebody had to come in, take that structure and make it work with that personnel. And as we already said, across the board, you saw guys and some of it is just maybe the natural guys who were entering their third year. Chase Young was a third-year player. Jeff Okuda was a third-year player. Multiple guys on that defense were third-year players. So it it made some sense that maybe they were just peaking at the right time. But I think you also have to give Halfley some credit that year for the the success that they had. Or I would give him the – if you're breaking up those – if you're taking 100% and breaking it up, I would give him the edge just because he was, at the end of the day, I think the one most responsible for how that defense was called on a game-to-game basis. Okay. And you are describing this in a way that sounds like he – 
was very flexible to what the strengths of his roster were when mm-hmm. he was kind of constructing what this defense looked like. Can you talk about, um, and I know you weren't there in 2018, but you were around a lot of people who were, and I'm sure had a lot of conversations about that. Can you talk about like the, the schematic changes that, that the team saw from 18 to 19? I don't remember exactly which alignment they played in 2018, but I know it wasn't a a single high system where you had that second safety nickel slot, whatever, uh, playing in the box so much. So I think that was one of the big changes. I've, I was told also, I think that the, the linebacker coaching that was happening that year was subpar and they made a change there. There's a reason why they didn't bring that guy back. They brought in Al Washington, who's now the defensive line coach at mm-hmm. uh, at Notre Dame, but is also a, is a former Boston College player and is now one of the guys in the mix to potentially succeed Halfley if you listen to the, the speculation that's out there. And oh, that was, I think, an important change. They had a guy named Malik Harrison, who's been a good uh, linebacker for the Ravens here the last few years. Another yeah. mid-round pick was a just a stud as, as the will linebacker on that team. You had a guy named Pete Werner, who was sort of this... Werner, yeah. Uh, yeah, Pete Werner was an incredibly important player on that defense. And I don't know, I, I uh, uh, even though I have sort of followed the Bears throughout my life, I don't can't say I know the Packers roster that well right now. But if you have someone at... Like he was a tremendous Sam linebacker that year. He ended up moving inside to Will for his for the COVID year in 2020, and that's what propelled him into the NFL. Uh, but as the Sam that year, they were able to really utilize him as a guy who was so versatile in that defense that even when you were playing safeties down in the box, I mean there were there were times when maybe you're blitzing a safety and now he's going back dropping back quickly in coverage to take that spot. You know what I mean? Like it, he was a really key piece of what they were doing. And that was uh, a, a defense that was still playing three linebackers, which is something that they don't do anymore. So, so uh, I, I think that the biggest change health was a factor, but I do think that Halfley and day coming in with a, with a specific scheme Sometimes it's just that you settle on an identity and you go out and execute it. And I think that that's what happened in 2019 as opposed to 2018, where I don't know if if the whole thing, if everybody was on the same page. It feels like that 2019 group, everybody was definitely on the same page. You had Larry Johnson. He is a four-man front defensive line coach. That is what he has staked his whole career on. Ryan Day wanted forward down linemen. That was it's part of that structure. He wanted that. You know, you had a guy come in in Washington who it didn't, didn't end up working out long term for him at Ohio State, but he was able to get more out of those linebackers by coaching them in a way that fit with the entire defensive concept than what they were getting before. Just a bunch of little things like that. And it, when you that speaks I think to Halfley's what propelled him to be a head coach, frankly, so quickly is some of it is consensus building. Some of it is coming in and taking authority and saying, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it and and delegating responsibilities beyond that. So that'll obviously be a big part of what he's now asked to do as the, the leader of this defense. Yeah, very impressive for such a young guy too to come in with that kind of gravitas and, and pulled people together towards such a cohesive vision. Um, and uh, I got some questions about the linebackers, um, but I want to take a five second detour and talk about Al Washington um, just because backers are going to be looking for a lot of position coaches. And obviously, you know, there's going to be the first place you're going to look is who's worked with Jeff Halfley in the past. Now, Al Washington, it seemed like the, the big reason why it didn't work out for him at Ohio State was recruiting related yeah. more than anything. So that was um, a factor. But but it also has felt in a big way, at least after 2019, that the linebackers he coached at Ohio State have kind of gone on to be a little more successful in the NFL than it felt like they were at Ohio State. That's my perspective. Do you agree with that or do you think I'm off base there? No, I think there is some some truth to that. We knew uh, Harrison was a known quantity for 2019, and, and that has worked out as I think most expected. With Pete Werner, he, again, he started in that, that Sam linebacker role. They moved him inside to the Will role in 2020, and I think you saw that that wasn't a – 
expected translation transition at the time uh, until we like got into spring and saw what they were doing and then it started to make sense to us that he had the kind of athleticism that you want from a guy who's going to be given that much responsibility to chase guys down and the one that really stands out though is Baron Browning a guy who Ohio State could just never find the right use for him and frankly if, if this was a three-man front, if they played fewer four-man fronts, he's a – it's what the Broncos do with him now, right? I mean, you would line him up outside as a linebacker there, but he'd get to also have a lot of pass rush responsibilities. They did use him effectively as a pass rusher at times. He had several sacks that 2019 year because they would bring him up kind of on Chase Young's hip and just blitz them – blitz him along as, as Chase Young's coming around. And Chase Young would get hit, a, hit by a double team or more, but that – that isn't accounting for Browning. He could just come around the edge. And there was always, it was obvious that he had all the skill in the world. They just couldn't find the right fit for him. He wasn't really a Mike linebacker. He had a lot of physical gifts that the other Mike I was just talking about, Tough Borland, didn't really have. And it wasn't really like what fit his game the best, though. There were other things, you know, from processing and, and being able to just kind of lead a team and get it together out there where Borland was the better option. So it was just a matter of trying to line up. They finally, I guess, he, he played a lot of Sam that third year, but they also, or fourth year, I should say, but they also would. When he was splitting that Mike position with Borland, they it became obvious over the course of that year that you know Borland would start the game, but a lot of times late in games, late in important games, Browning was the one on the field or on on on, on later uh, you know passing downs and things like that. He would be the one on the field. I think he actually maybe have ended up playing more snaps than him that year. So. so- it, it, with Al Washington, I think you're right that I think they, they did hit a point where not just the recruiting, it was it wasn't necessarily that they weren't getting good recruits. They had a 2018 class that was pretty loaded on what they thought on highly ranked linebackers. The development just didn't pan out with them. They, they got to the 2021 season and you're kind of looking around for who was supposed to be leading that group and it, and they were having trouble finding guys to do that it it just all sort of fizzled out on them at the same time and and he then ended up leaving as part of a, a full staff overhaul they were if they were bringing in a different defensive coordinator maybe he would have stayed i don't know but they were bringing in jim Knowles, who coaches linebackers and that's one of the reasons why they just parted ways at that point over the last um, number of years at Ohio State, there's been uh, defensive buzzwords. So, you know, we have the jack role that uh, they're trying to find the guy to play. And then before that, you had the bullet. Uh, take a trip down memory lane. Do you remember them talking about the Viper when Havlu was there? Is that ringing bells? Or, is, or has there been too many uh, trendy buzzwords <laughs> since then? I, I don't remember the Viper. I definitely remember the bullet and that being a thing that – we kept looking for who's going to be the bullet, who's going to be the bullet. And then I think in retrospect, we were like, oh, that was just Pete Werner. That, for, for people who aren't familiar, it was kind of supposed to be this hybrid linebacker safety role. I can't remember. It, it came from, they called it something else at Michigan. Was that where they called it? The Viper oh, you know there, what? I, I think. think. They did call it the Viper at, at Michigan. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's right. where, I think Madison brought that word, but they weren't going to call it what Michigan called it, right? Like they would have rather blown the stadium up than do that. So they had to come up with another name and bullet, the you know, silver bullet defense is an old thing for Ohio State. So that's where that came from. And that just ended up being what Pete Werner was in that defense. So kind of that. What is, I guess, maybe a, a more just of what you think of as a modern linebacker, right? They're not necessarily the big, thick-necked guy, although actually he, we called him the neck because he has a pretty thick neck. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't – it's it's not like what James Laurinaitis was, what A.J. Hawk was. They look a little bit a little bit different now, uh, even at the, the NFL level. And we're starting to see that in the kind of guys that Ohio State is now um, – bringing through and, and making some position changes potentially at the guys that just sort of modernize that position a little bit. So uh, Halfley, it has now just in this five year period, I think had an interesting, um, by, by, by that one year at Ohio state, he got to see what it was like to coach a lot of NFL guys to be in charge of what was 
again, I just I named off all these guys that are now in the NFL or at least had their shot at the NFL. Really, that entire starting defense had some piece of the NFL, even if it was just getting in training camps, being on practice squads. And, and there's only one or two of those guys I mentioned that that applies to. Most of those guys have gotten in the NFL and stuck or, you know, with the exception of Arnett and his off the field problems. So he knows what it's like, I think, to coach guys at this level with this kind of talent and now it's just a matter of taking that experience but then on top of it now i think once you've been a head coach you know what you expect from a coordinator better than when you were a coordinator so i think that's something else that could be beneficial for him now that he knows how to communicate up the chain because he has been the one on the receiving end of those conversations. I'm, I'm curious uh, to see how that fits for him because I think all along, I remember reading uh, some pieces to get ready for this and he was when he was getting the Broyles, um, he was a nominee for the Broyles Award in 2019 and said something along the lines of he had he was planning to go be an NFL coordinator and become an NFL head coach. And then he got this detoured back to college to he could coach with Brian Day. And he thought that it was like the greatest thing, the most the best thing, he best choice he would ever made. But it tells you that this has always been the long term goal for him. I know a lot of people were like shocked that he or surprised, at least that he left Boston College to go up to Green Bay. It didn't really surprise me that much because I think his long term goal has never been to like go to a place like Boston College and be there for 15 years. Even Boston College is going to be the stepping stone to some other job. And I think this is someone who probably wants to prove himself at the NFL level and someday get his NFL head coaching shot. It did surprise me. Uh, I remember in 2019, 2020, uh, as a big Packers fan, daydreaming about like, oh man, what if we could get Jeff Halfley to come coach the Packers? At no point did I ever put him on my list of like candidates to be considering because I just didn't think that was going to happen. I thought, you know, Boston College and then, you know, another better Power Five head coaching job and, you know, maybe eventually NFL head coaching job. So I'll be interested to see how long he does stick as the DC at Green Bay. Obviously, a new challenge for him to, to, you know, prove that he can succeed at that first. But um, it's the other, other interesting thing about him is just how sort of fast of a riser he has been. I mean, I you know, to leave after less than a year at Ohio State, you know, to go get it, you know, this job at at BC obviously shocked a lot of people and you know, he's kind of been just a, you know, impressive rising star forever. Yeah, I don't know if I would say like the Boston College thing has been a little uneven, right? I mean, it, not that it's a place where you expect to go and win 10 games a year, but they seem like they might have plateaued a little bit. So that also played into the timing, too, of, of probably why this is a good time for him to make this move. It's it's a place that a, a, a franchise in Green Bay that, you know, has some stability and has some pieces that you can win right away. And you know that it is at least buys you a few years. Whereas at Boston college, even though they've been like a bowl team, it hasn't really broken through to a- another level beyond like that six win, maybe seven win level. So was that going to be something that he could keep doing for long term, or was this the right time to make this jump? Because I think you, maybe you disagree, but I think I would rather, I think you're better off trying to make the jump from NFL coordinator to NFL head coach than college head coach to NFL head coach. I think there it's just, Absolutely. that's a more seamless transition. So if that is your long-term goal, which I, I have always thought it was, then I think this, this makes a lot of sense for him. Packers have um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 first round picks on their defense. Um, they've invested just an in absurd amount of capital into that defense with like piddling results and like on a player by player basis i can go through and like i like a lot i like the individual players and a lot of them have been you know former pro bowlers all pros whatever but they're they're not just they're just not gelling together and it doesn't think the packers are getting the most out of their guys which is a frustrating thing it, that one year at Ohio State in 2019, it seemed like everybody had their career best year. Um, you know, we saw that with your Chicago Bears in 2018. Every defender had the best year of their career at the same time. So getting the most out of the guys is a number one priority here for the Jeff Halfley hire. Um, 
Can you talk about what you observed of Halfley as a teacher? Uh, especially, you know, you talked about him, his involvement in, in the secondary. Talk about what you know of him as a teacher of those young players and what they thought. So, so Halfley did, I guess, like I said, inherit a talented group there and, and guys who were considered you know, NFL players and, and first round picks, a couple of them in that secondary. And those guys had also been taught, recruited, developed by Kerry Combs, who had a long history of success at Ohio State as a secondary coach and now is with the Titans, I think, doing similar things in the NFL. So, so that no, I'm sorry. He's at Cincinnati now, but he he had been at he had been at the Titans. Um, he's at Cincinnati uh, University, of Cincinnati now. But he had been with the Titans before he came back to yeah. He had been with the Titans before he came back to Ohio State as 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 the replacement, uh, the successor to Halfley as defensive coordinator. That didn't go that great, but. More to the point, like he 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 develops guys well. Like he had done it for years and years. All those first round NFL. Um, cornerbacks at Ohio State produced for seemingly like an endless string of them there for several years. Those were all Kerry Combs guys and Arnett and, and, and Okuda were Kerry Combs guys too. So he did inherit a good situation there. I don't think you can't ignore that. All I know is that again, not having covered that 2018 team when talking to those guys in 2019, they all said that Halfley's influence made a difference. You know, his perspective on the game, his way of teaching them. I think I remember Damon Arnett specifically saying that the way that Jeff Halfley probably like changed his career just from the way that he came in and was able to just give him a couple of tips the way that not just some of it is about how he contorted himself and like and and, and approached the job but then also just the way that he would watch film and see things on the field that Halfley kind of sometimes just a new voice even if the other guy is doing a good job sometimes a new voice can help so so I he definitely had an influence. He was only here for the one year, but he had an influence at least on those guys doing their jobs. Now the problem with the transition from 2019 to 2020 was that Fuller went to the NFL draft, Okuda went to the NFL draft, Arnett went to the NFL draft, and Sean Wade changed positions to something that wasn't necessarily a better fit for him. And all of a sudden the secondary was a problem in 2020. But I don't really put that on Halfley that much for problems or, or his inability to develop that group because you had there were cornerback recruiting issues that went back. I'm going to get two in the weeds here for Ohio State. But the cornerback recruiting issues that dated a couple years before that that started to come to fruition in 2020 and they had to just kind of try to figure it out on the fly. Yeah, Richard Sherman was talking about his time being coached by Jeff Halfley, and one of the uh, praises that he had of him, and I didn't write it down, so this is you know me paraphrasing what I remember, was that like Halfley was putting all the work on himself with the tape and everything, and that um, he was, you know, sort of like dumbing down the responsibilities that were required of Sherm and the other cornerbacks, that their job was almost more like read and react and less thinking on the field because Halfley did such a good job of preparing them. Um, does hearing that, you know, resonate with uh, any of the stuff that you remember those uh, defensive backs talking about, about their time studying under Halfley at Ohio State? Yeah, I, again, I think it was just that you had someone coming in with a obvious, with, with, with an immediate NFL connection, like a guy who was coming in, and that, that resonates with these guys at the college level. Like, if you were a proven NFL coach, you have a proven NFL background, that, and it Halfley hadn't been in the NFL long. Like that, I think that might that was his first NFL job, right? With the the 49ers. like he was he has been mostly a college coach He's a position in his career. Coach with the the Browns and the Buccaneers okay. before that. Okay, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, but I think that those things definitely resonate with the college guys because that's where they want to get. And when you can come in and say, "Hey, this is I, this guy that I've been coaching on Sundays, who you've all been watching. This is how he and I worked this problem. This is how he and I developed this skill." I think those things really mattered at the college level. At the obviously at the the NFL level, it's going to be in the job that he's in now. It's going to really be. A bigger picture than that it's not going to be as granular anymore about like teaching a position it's going to be more about you know building that game plan each week and just keeping everybody on task and and, and delegating those responsibilities 
The game plan is a big deal uh, for an NFL defensive coordinator. And no matter how hard you prepare for every opponent, there's still going to be times when what you came in here planning to do doesn't work on the field and you got to make some adjustments. Can you think of any uh, games in that 2019 season where um, there were some adjustments that that appeared to be really impactful, halftime adjustments, whatever, where, uh, you know, you could see the the defense really uh, reacting to and recovering from a, ch- a challenge that was presented to them? No, not really. <laughs> that defense was pretty awesome. That defense was pretty dominant. I guess maybe the closest thing was, if you go back to the 2019 Big Ten Championship game against Wisconsin, which is a team they had beaten in the regular season at Ohio Stadium, You know, usually Ohio State gets into an indoor situation against teams like that, and they're in even better position to just come in and blow them away. Chucking the ball around. Yeah, and Wisconsin led that game at halftime. And I remember Jonathan Taylor having some success in the first half. I I don't remember, again, the finest details of that game. And I think that part of the problem in that game was actually getting the offense on track and getting it going. um, Because that, that defense bought that offense so much room for error that it really didn't need. You had Justin Fields coming to into his own his first year after transferring in from Georgia. You had J.K. Dobbins running for 2,000 yards. You know, Garrett Wilson was just a little freshman on that team because they had other receivers that were the primary guys on that team, although he became more important as time went on. Chris Olave also on the team, so two first-round receivers. So, But for the most part, that defense controlled – every game it was in and even games where the offense might scuffle early on it was always just a matter of time that that, that defense just didn't yield points it didn't yield first downs it didn't yield um anything really um the, the bigger the, the 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 setback came in the fiesta bowl against clemson the playoff semifinal and that game still, though, I would put that game on the offense. I mean, they they only allowed, what was the final score of that game? I think 23 points, maybe 22, 23 points to Clemson in that game, if I'm remembering right, mid-20s. And the biggest problem in that game was Ohio State had to settle for three or four field goals in the first half when they, they – if they turn any of those into touchdowns, it changes the complexion of that game. They did have some breakdowns in the second half, partially because Sean Wade got ejected for a targeting call, and they had to play some backups and play some guys out of position in some some ways that they weren't really prepared to play. And Trev, Trevor Lawrence, if you guys have heard of him, was, was able to take advantage of that. So that's really the closest thing to a game where maybe they needed an answer on defense and just couldn't find one. But there were some extenuating circumstances there, too. And, and, and frankly, I think the defense played well enough for them to win that game. Yeah, one of my uh, overriding memories from that game is Trevor Lawrence just running down the field over and over again, just you know, murdering um, the defense with his feet. Um, and the interesting thing, you know, as I there's a uh, interview just from the last few weeks of Jeff Halfley uh, talking with somebody over at Boston College, uh, media member there, about his uh, single high philosophy and, and talking about how. You know, it's so important to him to neutralize the QB run game um, at the college level. And and as Packer fans, uh, we have some uh, PTSD from like Colin Kaepernick, um, you know, some other mobile quarterbacks over the years. Uh, It'll be an interesting thing to me to see how he adjusts to, you know, this new era of the mobile NFL QB, uh, which has been a big point of concern for him in college is trying to neutralize that and yet it's such a passing uh pass heavy offense in the nfl that you know playing this single high coverage uh is is risky it's it's not the safe comfortable move um it'll be interesting to see how he balances that yeah, again, I, I think it comes down to personnel because in 2019, that defense, that scheme worked superbly for Ohio State. But again, they had a generational edge rusher. They had first round talents at both cornerback positions. They had an underrated guy at, at that free safety, a veteran guy who had uh, just a lot of smarts and um, had been through the year before when things didn't go well and was frankly one of the reasons why it didn't go well at times. I think Jordan Fuller was just had some, some struggles. 
struggles in 2018 and all of a sudden 2019 with Halfley's influence, he was just a much more solid player at the back end of that defense. So I think it, 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 personnel is going to be a thing here. And you again, you know the personnel better than I. You, as you said, the Packers have, have clearly assembled some defensive talent here. I think it's just a matter of does it is it the right fit for that scheme? And if not, do you make some adjustments? Again, in 2019, Ryan Day was adamant that they were going to run that that scheme. That was the scheme that he wanted for his program. And they That's interesting. after all those guys left in 2019, he was adamant they were going to keep it for 2020. And it, I mean, it worked well enough to get them to the national championship game, but you can go back and see places where the cracks were showing. And in 2021, it, it kind of fell apart. I mean, they were still 11-2 and two that year. It wasn't a disaster, but they didn't you know, they lost to Michigan for the first time in forever and lost another game at home to Oregon and defense was a problem all season for them, just being able to play consistently on defense. So so I think that if here, even if that is his base philosophy, I think you'll see a broader approach to defense than probably what he was allowed to do for, for that season at Ohio State. Seemed like one of the big keys to defensive line success for that 2019 team was interior pressure, just collapsing the pocket to allow Chase Young to uh, feast. Is 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 that assessment that I have? Does it strike uh, you know resonate with you? And uh, you know, can you tell me about the uh, defensive uh, tackles that that Ohio State had that year? Yeah, they had a three-man rotation at tackle. Uh, the two guys I mentioned earlier, uh, Davon Hamilton, Jay Sean Cornell, and then the third guy, uh, B.B. Landers. And that was really the, the top of it. They had some other guys underneath. Tommy Togiai, who was an NFL draft pick, uh, deeper in the rotation. Um, Haskell Garrett, deeper in the rotation. Another guy who was um, had, had some really strong years after that for Ohio State. But it was really that three-man group at the top. But really, I mean, what Chase Young was relative to the rest of college football that year, people don't remember. I mean, he was a Heisman Trophy finalist. He, he was just a phenomenon that year, a uh, force of nature. And it that probably isn't a realistic comp for anything that the Packers would do. I don't know if they have anybody that's going to go out and dominate games the way that Chase Young did that year. So that's a hard comparison to try to make just because – he was the true game wrecker, right? Like he, there was nothing that a lot of teams could do. You would try to double team him. And then that just left you very exposed to what was coming at those other three positions. A little bit like asking somebody to run the Rams defense without Aaron Donald. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, I mean every team has its, its guys, but yeah, uh, Ohio State definitely saw has seen the effects ever since then of not really having an elite edge rusher like that, a guy who just piles up sacks like that, and the influence of that, how that resonates through the rest of the defense. So if the Packers have uh, someone like that that they feel like they can unleash, uh, that that'll make that'll make it better. But that that's true of whoever uh, they're bringing in as coordinator. Packers have had 11 draft picks in each of the last three years, and, and they stack multiple draft picks um, in a bunch of other years as well to get beyond just the you know your normal seven. Um, it's kind of crazy with how many guys the uh, Buckeyes have sent to the NFL and how many draft picks they've had. The, the only Buckeye on the Packers roster right now is Josh Myers. Um, but there are uh, four guys, uh, sorry, five guys, in this upcoming draft class, who the Packers realistically could have a chance at drafting. You got Mike Hall, Tommy Eichenberg, and Josh Proctor on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Mike Hall in particular is is intriguing to me. Can you talk about uh, your thoughts about fit for those three guys in the NFL? The interesting thing uh, for a lot of us, too, is that Josh Proctor did play for Jeff Halfley and, and played mm -hmm. a, a decent number of snaps that year as well. So uh, thoughts on those those three defensive guys? Yeah, Proctor was the reserve free safety behind Jordan Fuller that year, and he actually was the one that they asked to play out of uh, position a little bit in that game against Clemson. They went away from the single high to playing a little bit more two safety looks that year or that game, but it was a position that Proctor hadn't played all season and it just it, it didn't really help. Didn't go that well. Um, Hall is, you're right. I mean, he's the, of those guys, the most intriguing 
high end NFL talent to me. I think all three of those guys can can be on rosters. But Hall, uh, you brought you brought up Aaron Donald. They call him his teammates call him Baby Aaron Donald. And now that never resonated in such a way that he broke through to like you know some kind of All American stat performance. But if you want to go, and I think for for a college game, the PFF grades are a little bit sketchier, frankly, than they are for for the NFL. But you can go back and look and see like the where he gets credit for you know, really high grades for creating pressure, um, getting a lot of hurries on the interior. He, I think, is going to be a, a three tech at this next level. He is just a little bit more of a like lean body. He's not really a run stuffer necessarily. He's more of a penetrator guy who gets in the backfield and can make plays there. But was just kind of burst onto the scene at the start of the 2022 year and had had some really huge games. There was a game where against Michigan State where he'd. Been been battling some injuries and will play like eight snaps and had two and a half sacks or something like that like so he's had some some real bang for the buck performances and uh he is i think someone who could um make a pretty quick impact in the nfl i just think the talent's there he just had a really good senior bowl uh week at the senior bowl and was named like the outstanding defensive lineman down there by the other offensive linemen so that that all points to i think him being probably a second day guy in the draft who could could make a, a quick impact i can Berg is a kind of quintessential middle linebacker at, at this level, at the college level, and a really cerebral guy. Uh, Jim Knowles' defense, when he came in, really turned him into a, like kind of a downhill weapon and uh, brought out this, the, the two best years of his career by far. And then Proctor has always had these playmaking skills. We just weren't sure it was ever going to fully come together for him. He broke his leg at the start of the 21 season. He started the 2022 season and one play in, got benched for missing a tackle and just never got his job back because Ohio State has a guy there named Lathan Ransom who's going to be in the NFL probably after next year. And he came back sort of surprisingly for this sixth year and then put together a really solid year. So I think all three of those guys are potentially guys who could help NFL teams. I, I Proctor's fit is probably... Uh, you know, he played really more of a free safety position here. I don't know if that's where he translates at the NFL level, but he's he's got the versatility and he's got the ability to make plays. I mean, he's laid some big hits in his career. He's made some academic or uh, acrobatic interceptions in his career. There are some underlying skills there that I think can translate to the NFL. Uh, one final thing with Mike Hall, um, you, know, you mentioned that he's uh, not much of a run stepper, which is fine because the Packers never try and stop the run anyways. They only seem to care about stopping the passer. Um, one of the uh, words that I will use, I'm not putting this in your mouth, but I, I think that um, sort of underwhelming is maybe a a word that a lot of people use to describe just sort of the results of Mike Hall's career, just in contrast with like, the sky high potential that we have seen he clearly has, but then like the, the uh, weekend and out consistency has been a little bit uh, disappointing or underwhelming to a lot of fans like myself. Um, if you do see any of that, what would you say is like the biggest thing for him to uh, sort of improve to reach that potential? Is it just like physical development and conditioning? Like he's got to keep growing up physically and, and, and get to where he can withstand a full season. Or is it more like, uh, you know, technique and, and learning stuff that, that really isn't quite connecting for him? I, I think both of those things, you know, in a perfect world, I think he would have come back to Ohio State for another year. And it's not because he wasn't excellent. It's just that, like, those things you're saying, I don't think the performance was as consistent as what you would have looked for from a guy who was a a clear NFL draft pick. He's got, you know, some family things that I think have pushed him to come out early. And like I said, I think he'll be a day two pick, and I I think he's got a long-term future. He came to Ohio State as a a pretty highly ranked prospect, like top 50-ish prospect, and didn't play at all that first year, partially because they had some other veterans on the interior. But also, like, I just don't think he was ready for that yet. And I think he took that initiative to get his body right and and get on the field and, and start making the impact that he did. Like, we heard it building. Like, we were told, like, okay, this is going to be a thing as, you know, coming through out of the spring into the summer into the fall camp. And then he had a really important big night in that season opening win over Notre Dame in 2022. And that kind of put him on the map and he built from there. So 
the whole defensive line, it, it's for Ohio State, it, it's – you could use the word underwhelming in some ways, even though they have a couple other guys that are future NFL guys, Jack Sawyer, JT Tuam, Lowell. Um, Tyleek Williams had a fantastic year as a defensive tackle. These are all names that you'll be talking about a year from now when this pretty much this entire Ohio State defense is going to the NFL combine probably because they all decided to come back for an extra year. But it's never been a defense ever since they lost Chase Young. I don't think they've had anybody get more than like five sacks in a season. It just hasn't been a, a big... I think they haven't, haven't had anybody get more than four. I yeah, so, I mean, it just hasn't been a, 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 a defense that piles up a bunch of counting numbers of from defensive front, I should say. They've been good. I mean, they were one of the best defenses in the country this year, and they've done okay, you know, stopping the run and things, and have been especially good against the pass, and they've created pressures. It's just they haven't been getting home, and I think Hall has been both a part of creating the pressures, but also a part of one of the guys who wasn't getting home as often as he wanted to. I think that would have been maybe the next step for him. If he had also joined this group of everybody who was coming back for another year, I think people would have projected a pretty Pretty big year for him as as in his fourth year, but it also works together, right? Like the the way it should work is the guys on the outside are creating the pressure, and then the guy on the inside can clean it up, and then vice versa. You know, you get the penetration that forces somebody outside into the waiting arms of a of a rush in. And for whatever reason, Ohio State just hasn't been able to get that formula together as even as much defensive line talent as they've had. And maybe this is twenty twenty four will be the year where. It, comes together in a fourth year for for all these guys but it, it hasn't quite come together yet and and hall was part of that mix while i got here nathan can you tell me about uh your thoughts on Cade stover and mayan Williams' offensive uh nfl draft prospects williams is is a little bit hard to peg right now i, I know there are people at ohio state that two or three years ago thought oh that guy's gonna be a draft pick like that that you just watch and he had some really good results in 2022 trevin henderson the lead back for ohio state was hurt a lot mine williams had to pick up that slack ended up you know, averaging somewhere up around, I think, seven yards a carry for the year. Now, he had his, he has had his own injury issues, too, and that's a concern, I think, as you look ahead to him in the NFL. He doesn't have a lot of tread uh, taken off the tires yet. I mean, again, because he's been sort of a part-time player or not never the full-time, like, bell cow starter for Ohio State, but has had enough different injury things pop up that um, that may be a battle for him to – continue to stay healthy in the NFL. Stover uh, came to Ohio State without really a position. He's He bounced around for a long time before they finally decided, like, no, you are a tight end. And these past two years, he really flourished. And for people who follow Ohio State football, they know that tight end is a position that doesn't necessarily get the ball a lot. But these past two years for both C.J. Stroud and then Kyle McCord uh, in 2023, he became a really important receiver, a really important uh, guy to not just really check down to, but a guy that you could um, target downfield in important ways. And I think he still has a ways to go as a blocker in terms of at the NFL level, but a, a, a guy who you can use as a receiving threat, I think that's there on the table for him pretty quickly in the NFL. Very cool. Thank you so much, Nathan, for your time here today. Uh, everybody follow Nathan on Twitter or X at NW Baird, B-A-I-R-D. Listen to Buckeye Talk uh, with Cleveland.com and do read Cleveland.com. Nathan, thank you for your time. Appreciate you. Sure thing. Thanks a lot. I'm not sure anybody, I think Mitch might, because he seems like he watches football and reads about football and doesn't do anything but football. I don't know if anybody has truly understand understands how big of a hire that was. Well, what an endorsement. That was the voice of Jeff Halfley, new Packers defensive coordinator. And when he said Mitch, he's talking to our own Mitch Wolf here, who is joining us from uh, Eagle Insider. Uh, that would be the Boston College Eagles of the 247 Sports Network. Mitch, thanks for hopping on here to talk about Jeff Halfley's time at, at Boston College. Happy to be on. Very happy to talk about this and uh, talk about my experience with Jeff at BC. Yeah, so uh, having Jeff sing your praises as a, uh, a student of football and uh, football film uh, makes me excited to talk to you about what was going on uh, schematically with the Boston College defense. Um, 
But first, looking back at Jeff Hefley's tenure at Boston College, how would you describe his overall impact on the program? And, uh, you know, are there any uh, lines that you would draw there to project his influence to his approach um, with the Green Bay Packers? So I'll say this. I think if you ask most BC fans, and I would say I, I would fall into this camp that based on where Jeff Halfley found Boston College football and where he left it when he did leave, I think it'd be hard to say he left it better than he found it. So a lot of people would say he left it worse than he did than when he found it, which I think you could have a lot of, you could have a long argument about. Um, but I think that the one thing that Jeff Halfley did was he instituted a very good culture about the program um, in terms of his relationship with the players, relationship with administration, recruits, what have you. The problem was that he struggled to establish an identity for the program on either side of the ball, which especially on defense, that was a problem. Now, I think that the reason why that happened is because this was Jeff Hapley's first head coaching job. It was, and even before he came to BC, he'd only been a co-coordinator for one year. So I think that a lot of the nuances of being a good head coach escaped him and he improved, but but, you know, a lot of the things about game in-game decision, game planning, from a head coach perspective, I think a lot of those things he struggled with. Not, And then obviously there's the external factors of, if you think about when Jeff Hadley was hired at BC, it was after the 2019 regular season. And if you compare that to where college football is today, it's almost a completely different sport. And sure. obviously there was a lot of talk about him wanting to get back to the NFL to just coach football. Uh you know, to not have to worry about fundraising, recruiting, which he has talked to me personally about that. And he, I, I totally believe that's true. I do also think that he made this move because he was concerned that if this upcoming season didn't go well for him, he would be fired. And then basically the opportunity to get back to the NFL, especially as a coordinator, would not present itself in the near future. Yeah, he talked, um, as we just heard on our, our last interview with Nathan Baird, that he mentioned – in his uh, uh, Broyles Award nomination speech that NFL defensive coordinator and maybe NFL head coach is his long-term goal that he's he's driving towards. So I can see where that would um, concern him, the idea of like, hey, you know, I was succeeding as a defensive coordinator. Uh, the uh, head coaching thing here at Boston College is not going, uh, you know, maybe according to plan. I want to make sure that I adjust course now while I still have mm -hmm. capacity to do so and have, have um, the opportunity to go tackle a, a challenge that I think I can succeed in. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think if you listen to a lot of what people have said about him, I know that that clip from Richard Sherman was going around and uh, mm -hmm. him talking about Halfley as, as a guy who has great preparation. I think that that is definitely true for a position group, for a defense, even, um, very attention to detail uh, attention to detail was is huge for him he's a very positive guy very much like power positivity like always looking at the bright side and not necessarily like naive or overly optimistic but just like you know manifesting good results with that positivity um and always looking to improve and i think that that's one, some of the things that do make him a very good and effective coach but like i said and a big again big reason why was because of how college football has shifted but some of these more things where you just need more reps as being head coach he just didn't have them i think that's why the results didn't turn out the way that he wanted and fans of bc wanted honestly yeah it seemed like a personal frustration of his has been how much of his job has been being the head coach of a modern college football program and that it's getting in the way of his ability to just go do what he wants to do, which is be a football coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Despite being the head coach, how involved was Jeff Halfley in the defense at Boston College? And how much, in your opinion, did he retain his defensive philosophy from his Ohio State days? So I, I'm pretty confident he did not call plays uh, – at pretty much at any time when he was uh, the head coach at uh, Tim Lukabu, who was the defensive coordinator for the first two, three years uh, held those duties. And then this past year was a bit of a weird scenario where Tim Lukabu left to be an NFL position coach, which I think kind of pre presaged Halfley leaving. And then yeah. there were co-coordinators um, 
One of them was Azar Abdul Rahim, who left to go be Maryland's defensive coordinator and defensive backs coach. I feel like he might have had play calling duties. And then the other co coordinator was Sean Duggan, who was a linebackers coach and had actually played at BC in the past. But if you have watched Ohio State in 2019 and you watch what BC's defense looked like over the last few years, there's definitely a lot of overlap in terms of schematics. Uh, okay. The big one being single high defenses. So one deep safety in the middle of the field uh, and coverages go along with that. So cover one and cover three, and then a lot of man coverage. Um, I mean, I have some stats for this. So during Halfley's tenure, the four seasons from 2020 to 2023, Boston college ran man coverage on 43% of their snaps, which was the fourth highest rate in college football. And just to compare uh, to Joe Barry, the exiting defensive coordinator in his three years as defensive coordinator for the Packers, he ran man coverage 20.6% of snaps, which was 27th in the NFL during that time. So huge shift. And along with side with that, Halfley has talked a lot about how much he loves to run press man coverage. So getting defenders up in the face of receivers, disrupting their timing so that, uh, the quarterback can't just have those easy access throws. And I, I'm talking to Halfley, his general philosophy specifically regarding defense and pass coverage is we want to make the quarterback consistently make difficult throws and namely deep down the field and to the outside. We don't want to allow quick, easy throws over the middle that can then turn into big yak opportunities. Essentially, we're going to make you throw deep and outside. If you're a good enough quarterback and you can consistently do that, then more power to you. Like you, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. And that does lead to some explosive plays issues. But again, like part, and then, you know, if you compare his defensive stats at Ohio state versus BC at BC, generally I would say below average in most departments, but at Ohio state it was elite. So it's kind of a talent versus scheme discussion you have here. So I think it's right. the result, the general results are probably somewhere in the middle where if you have, good enough talent you can run this scheme and generally with man coverage a more man heavy scheme that's more aggressive you want to have better players and better athletes which he didn't necessarily have all the time at bc but at the end of the day you know you can kind of quibble with how effective this strategy is but this is just Halfley's philosophy on how he wants to attack offenses and i say attack offenses and not defend them because again it is very aggressive Right. So, and that's kind of just how it is. And then, you know, I, a lot of BC fans had issues with it. But I'm saying, like, listen, like, he has a philosophy. That's just kind of how it is. And at the end of the day, like, you kind of respect that he has certain ideas of how to play this game. And that's how he's going to run his defense. Yeah, we have Isaiah McDuffie here, and we love him. We want to keep him for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, in a perfect world, and and I think that I can count on this happening, we won't be running a defense of 11 Boston College defenders. Um, so. No, and you probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've seen a lot of uh, Packers fans comparing statistical rankings of Boston College in a bunch of categories. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of trying to extrapolate that out over you know what the, the Packers might look like. Um, and, and so a big question for me is how much of this defense – at Boston College, you, you talked about schematically, but on, on a, a removing removing the overarching philosophy from the picture and just talking about like the the execution and the game planning and and teaching and everything. How much of the Boston College defense do you think is Jeff Halfley versus Tem Lukubu slash the two co coordinators this past year? I mean, do, do you think that this should be an accurate representation of like the results that you think? might carry over or is this like hey listen uh jeff provided the overall philosophy and said now go do because i gotta go uh schmooze donors and go recruit and you know do all the all these other things i think this i think the schema i think the schematics definitely translate i think you'd be a little harder to extrapolate all the results but i think that this is definitely like his defensive scheme and he's known tem lukabu for a while so i think they're decently aligned on those schematic philosophies and the execution of it so I think that watching what BC does schematically is an appropriate predictor for what you're going to see in Green Bay. And I, and I do think that a big reason why he got this job is because he is about as far away from Joe Barry as you can get schematically in terms of like completely different front structure, completely different coverage structure, you know, again, completely different coverage philosophy. So I think that, you know, 
you know, again, like I, I think I said this to you that even if it doesn't, if, even if it doesn't like work well in the end, I think Packers fans are just gonna be happy because it's gonna look so drastically different than what's been going on for the last three years. So in your view, Tim Lukabu didn't have like a ton of independence here that, that he was still working pretty closely with, with Jeff as far as. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, I think, and this past year, because of Lukabu leaving, Jeff said he, he talked about getting more involved with the defense, which had mixed results. And it's, it's kind of hard to parse out how effective they were because 2023 was a very strange season for BC because they started off uh, one and three with their one win coming close against Holy Cross and FCS opponent, a good FCS team, but and then barely losing to Florida State, getting blown out by Louisville. And then they had a five game winning streak where the defense played a lot better and they used a lot more diverse coverages, a lot more aggressive blitzing. Um, so the defense looked very different. And then the last three regular season games, they completely fell apart. And some of that was due to injuries and suspensions. So there's some other factors there, but it's hard to kind of say, okay, what, who is the real BC defense? And obviously during that five game win streak, a lot of them were close games against frankly, not that good of opponents. So it's okay. How do, how does this really translate? Um, yeah. But so, and again, this is where I'm saying Halfley was allegedly more involved with the defense, but I think because of what he said to me, like, I think you could say like his involvement di- was his involvement did lead to those, that more like diverse defensive game plans that they employed during that five game winning streak. Because going back and look at the numbers for that, that's that uh, stretch of games, every opponent, and they had relatively different offenses. You know, they played army one week and then, you know, they played Georgia tech, which was more spready air raid kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of different types of coverages and again, different uh, varying how much they blitzed versus how much they dropped into coverage to bring blitz to different places. So I think, it, I think you can say he's still like pretty involved with installing what he wants his defense to be. And then he kind of, he kind of just leaves left. He pretty much just left the offense to its own devices. Um, and I don't think he was really? particularly involved with that outside of um certain end game decisions involving like going for it on fourth down, going for two, that kind of thing. So, uh, so he, he didn't call the, the plays on either side of the ball. Uh, definitely not on offense. And I'm pretty sure not on defense. Okay. Um, looking back at his time at, at OSU and, and the scheme and the philosophies, uh, do any of these terms uh, strike you, you know, f- with familiarity about you know, how he might talk about the uh, Boston College defenders. So it, at Ohio State, you know, they had a role that um, it had previously been called uh, the Viper at Michigan, but then, you know, it's Ohio State, so you can't use the same word that, that they call it at Michigan. So they well, so I'll, I'll, I'll just interject really quickly here. Yeah. So Don Brown was a defensive coordinator at BC for a few years. So he re- we're very, I didn't, I didn't remember mm-hmm. that. Yeah, so before he came to Michigan, he was the defensive coordinator at BC okay. um, under Steve Adazio from 2013 to, I want to say, 16. And in 2015, they had the n- number one or number two defense across a bunch of categories. They The problem was the offense was absolute garbage because they had no quarterbacks in the offensive line. So it was one of like the weirder teams where the defense was absolutely elite and the offense was absolutely terrible. So, but yeah, so personally, we're pretty familiar with Don Brown and, and the Viper position. <laughs> Okay, as Packer fans, and and my my audience is not a, a college football audience at okay. all. It's, it's strictly Packers. Mm-hmm. No familiarity with the Viper role. Can you talk about it? number one? Is that still something that Halfley was using uh, when he was there at Boston College? And if so, like, is this something we need to be uh, prepared for them to like find a guy to play this role in Green Bay? And what the heck is it? So short answer, no. Um, no, don't I don't think anymore. he uses it as much anymore. Um, and I'm not even really sure if that's a him thing. So from what I remember from the Ohio State defense that year that he was the co-coordinator, they were blessed with the ability to run a 4-3 base, play with one deep safe, literally one safety on the field that was Jordan Fuller, and then have three cornerbacks on the field. So it was technically a 4 technically a 4-3, four, three, four, three, but it had some nickel stuff because you have the slot corner instead of that or safety. And Again, if you look at that defensive roster, it's absolutely loaded with talent. Chase Young, uh, Jay Sean Cornell, Davon Hamilton, Jonathan Cooper, Tyreek Smith, uh, Zach Harrison, Baron Browning, Malik Harrison, Tuff Borland, Pete Werner, and then obviously uh, Jeff Okuda, who's a big fan of Halfley's, uh, Gary and Conley, Sean Wade, and like I said, Jordan Fuller. So mm-hmm. NFL talent just completely up and down the depth chart there. At BC, it was a much more traditional 
four three slash four two five nickel where there's a sl- there's a sl- there's a slot corner slot defender and there's a you know two safeties and there's strong safety. I will say that again, he's very fond of single high defenses. Loves to bring the strong safety into the box. In nickel, that defender is kind of playing a pseudo linebacker role. But compare, I don't. I think comparing it to the Don Brown Viper position would be incorrect because that safety position is still more of a traditional safety. The slot corner is more of a traditional slot corner. Although, again, Halfley does like to be aggressive with his blitzing. Um, let me let me see what my status for that. So again, during his four year tenure. He blitzed on 33.6 of opponents' dropbacks, which was the 22nd highest rate in the NFL, or sorry, in college football, uh, which honestly, when you compare it to Joe Barry's, which was 30.1%, uh, it was 12th in the NFL, but that's close to the mid-range, whereas 22nd in college out of 130-some teams is a lot higher. So you're going to see much more aggressive man blitzing, a lot of very creative uh exotic blitz looks especially on third and long third and passing downs uh you're gonna see some more sim pressures or creepers where they put a lot of guys up at the line of scrimmage and so if there's like six guys around the line around the ball but then they'll drop two out so it's still only a four-man rush but you confuse the offense um and they get very aggressive especially when i talk about like he's very aggressive man coverage on third down it's he's especially aggressive but like they're running okay. man coverage nice. usually cover one or cover zero on almost every third down so I think you're looking at a more traditional personnel structure out of a 4-3 defense, but that is going to be an adjustment because obviously the Packers under Barry run more of a 3-4 with some more odd front principles, which to Halfley's credit, in the last two years, they did um, incorporate some more of those, but it was definitely more of a change up than the primary uh, defense. All right, two questions for you. One, does Halfley still call the uh, the free safety at Boston College? Does he still call that the eraser? Like he did it. Uh, not that. No, not that I know. I don't think so. I think he just calls it the free. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, I think what he said it's a re- eraser and adjuster. Were the, those were the two names? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think he's kind of just gone back to more traditional uh, nomenclature for positions at BC. <laughs> Actually, I think I think adjuster. I think that's a Jim Knowles thing, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that that's a Jim Knowles. Um, he Jim Knowles calls it the bandit and the adjuster. Oh, okay. So he, he's terrible at naming things, Jim Knowles. <laughs> um, but uh, no, yeah, uh, Jeff Halfley was the one who said eraser. So um, one of the uh, things that uh, Nathan Baird told us on with the Ohio State time was that Halfley – uh, showed a a good willingness to adjust and and um, uh, sort of like craft the defense to the to the skills of the players he has. Which, frankly, with the players he had, you could kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> at, at BC, did you see him um, sort of catering that defense? to the players he had or was it more like trying to fit the players he had to the scheme he wanted i feel like it would honestly be more the latter which is kind of surprising given that you would think that with a lesser talent pool you would be willing to be more flexible um that's a tough one though because i think he did do a pretty good job and i think i think what i've said about halfley's defense is that again unlike the kind of Vic Fangio lineage of defenses is that there isn't, there aren't going to be all these checks and all these complicated rotations for everything. It's, it's a lot more like we're going to simplify the assignment. You have like just a few things to look for. So, you know, your assignment. So you reduce the number of mistakes you can make and you can play a lot faster. And I think that's, I think players, the players appreciated that, you know, even if like some of them. So for example, um, BC's, la- BC's main corner for the last few years has been Elijah Jones. Uh, 6'1", 180 pounds. He's very tall, very lanky. Good good press man corner. Uh, before last year, their slot defender was named Josh DeBerry. And he was – so he, and he transferred to Texas a and this last year. He's like 5'11", 175 pounds. You know, still pretty skinny, but much shorter arm. You know, he's, he's the slot guy. And – it's not like they were, they would force DeBerry to do a lot of the same assignments that Jones would, you know, Jones would be the backside 
corner that takes out the X receiver because he's taller, he's longer. And DeBerry would be slot. They'd play him outside sometimes against base personnel. Um, but I think, and I think I have to look at the numbers for what his man stats were, but I feel like he ran more zone early on. Okay. Um, and it was again, mostly cover three. And then as he kind of got more comfortable with the players and knew what they could do, then he used more man. And I think that that's, again, that's, that's kind of just what he's going to do now. Like I said, with this last year, when he had more input on a weekly basis, I think he is more willing to make adjustments and have little tweaks to the game plan based on the opponent, which in the NFL is obviously super important. And again, because he won't have to be worrying about recruiting, fundraising, you know, dealing with the transfer. We're like, he can be more focused on that actual game planning stuff during the season. So I think that'll be really helpful for, you know, maybe his defense will look a little more diverse than it has over the past five years or so. Did you see, um, at BC, any trends toward a proclivity towards playing young, intriguing, uh, you know, sort of high, higher ranked uh, prospects <laughs> versus like the experienced veteran who you know you can trust, even if they don't have as high of a ceiling as the young guy. Oh no, the, Jeff Halfley. You know, it's it's weird. It's weird to say this given that he kind of left BC hanging in this way, but. Jeff Halfley is exceptionally loyal to guys who have been around for a while and guys who work very hard. So there's, there's an example this year. Um, this. Had, the guy actually joined the team the last year. His name is John Pupil. And he joined the team as a transfer from Dartmouth. And he didn't yeah. play. I think he made us play on special teams last year. This year, because BC lost their strong starting strong safety to the NFL, they brought in a few transfer portal guys here and there. But they essentially elevated Pupil to be the starting strong safety. And he played the majority of the snaps that position. And yeah, he's an Ivy League athlete, and he looked about he looked like that, and he was really struggling in coverage. He was very he was very willing to come downhill and hit against the run, and, but he was just not cut out to play against Power Five athletes. Um, but he just kept playing and kept getting snaps, and it was very frustrating for BC fans that this kept happening. But Halfley talked a lot about how much he loved John Pupil, how much he respected him. There's another guy, BC's middle linebacker for the last few years, named Vinny De Palma, who's you know. 5'11 on a good day, 230 pounds on a good day, but he's a, you know, he's a white Italian linebacker from New Jersey. He doesn't wear gloves and he will just come down and hit the blocker in the gap. And, you know, and he has a lot of really good fourth down stops. I call them like fourth and one or fourth and two. And then he knows where to go. He, he, he's willing to hit anybody, but a lot of times he just struggled to get there because he's not as fast. And, uh, another guy last year, Marcus Valdez, was like a six-year player and worked through injuries, had like the big, huge brace on his arm because he, he's just been around forever. He's a robot. Um, you know, again, not the most explosive athletic guy, but knows where to go and he plays really hard. So, you know, in the NFL, obviously, you get some more of those high-caliber athletes. And I think I, – I'm not sure where I heard the quote, I think, but uh, Halfley has talked about basically whoever works the hardest and whoever – Whoever is playing the best and working the hardest, regardless of pedigree or position, they will get the playing time. Okay. So, you know, sometimes I think a lot of the times to his detriment, he would be loyal to guys that, you know, they were working hard for sure, but it's like, this guy's just not cutting it. Like in terms of what the results this team needs. Can you describe how he fostered team culture and discipline? <sighs> Ooh, okay, so that's interesting because I think I think I think the culture around BC was very good because the previous head coach was more of a disciplinarian, very tough guy, you know, no nonsense, and I think and he rubbed a lot of players the wrong way. And if you kind of look into, if you look deeper into it, if you can find a lot of former BC players that when they came back to BC after they graduated, the there was not a lot of respect from that coach and the program, which they found frustrating. Um, Halfley is very different. I, I think, and I think that's what makes the quote unquote betrayal very difficult. So I think the players really did like and respect him. I think he very much cared about the players, um, very much cared about turning them into good full players and good young men. And that's a big part of what BC is all about. Um, the problem, but then it was weird because everyone at, at the end of like the last few seasons, there have been kind of suspicious things where players just 
aren't playing anymore and uh, we have some we obviously have sources that you know report some things but we don't really want to put the players on blast and halfley does not he is very reticent to comment on that he does not want to put these players on blast the media which again you can kind of respect that um but i would say for the but that has been like one to two maybe two players a season like it has not been a pervasive issue of discipline um off the field if you're talking more about penalties a lot of people would tell you that oh bc's teams were so undisciplined over the last few years this year to start they got off to a really bad start they had i think 38 penalties in the first three games um the second the last That's one was against Packers florida state numbers right there the, the well Packers the last one was against florida like state that. and they set a program record with 18 in one game and frankly if they had just had a normal day of penalties they might have beaten florida state that day but they didn't now a big problem with that was they were installing a new quarterback kind of on the fly they had a new offensive lineman so a lot of those were cadence pre-snap issues on offense okay. so not necessarily halfley's fault there are some times when players are playing too great like there's usually like maybe once every other game there's like an, a late hit unnecessary roughness but halfley has talked about that he's saying like listen i'm not going to tell guys like I, I want guys to play safe but i'm not going to tell them to be less aggressive and he's kind of willing to write those penalties off because they are i feel they are not consistent and if you look at halfley's the bc's penalty averages over the last during halfley's tenure they're like maybe a little higher than average but i would and obviously his his defensive scheme of aggressive uh, man coverage is going to lead to some defensive pass interference holding penalties. But some of those, uh, he is I talked about, it, there are some penalties you're going to be willing to live with because guys are playing hard, they're competing. He doesn't, like, I would say BC doesn't really have, like, taunting penalties, um, even though I'm sure people are going to point to the Zay Flowers penalty against the Chiefs in the AFC Championship the other week. But that doesn't really happen. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, other discipline issued, like, related to penalties. Um, when you say I wouldn't, say, and I would say like not a lot of like offsides, encroachment, or like too many men on the field. Like not that's that has never really been a problem. So I think stuff. his and the defensive coaches involved with the defense has, and they've usually also had a lot of veteran players. So I would say there usually aren't those kinds of mistakes. And when you say um, the, the he wants his guys to play safe, you mean like physical safety, not like don't give up the big. Play. Yes, yes, yes. Like I like don't like it. Well, it's funny because there was one against Pitt this year where. The free safety came over, and I saw somebody describe it as a salmon jumping out of a river into a bear's <laughs> mouth because the guy just like leapt with his like leading with his head, and it was it was just so out of like out of left field. It's like what the heck happened? Like, and that's never really been a problem. Like, I don't think I can think of that one, and maybe one or two other targetings during BC's tenure. So yeah, it's about playing like physical safety for your own sake, not like not giving up. Like it's yeah, it's more about the physical safety. So Jeff is a, a defensive backs guy. What strategies uh, slash philosophies uh, do you believe that he emphasized for the secondary during his time at BC? Who I think the press man thing is very, is that's very much in his wheelhouse. He does not want to, give receivers free access off the line. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, there's one that I heard where he was talking about. He, they want guys to play the ball more, but it's, it's very technique focused. Like I would say that again, like he's very, excuse me, big on preparation for the defensive backs. Um, there was one play this year where, um, the team, the opponent ran the one ran this concept, and then they ran it from I think the same formation, but maybe it was they were going the other way in the field, and they had flipped the formation. And Halfley talked about how he talked with the cornerback who he got beat the first time, or I think he he might have gotten it might have been an incompletion, but he got beat. And the second time, the defender read it perfectly and made an interception. So. I think he does. <laughs> yeah, I think he does. Like with the man, the man thing is tough because obviously you want your eyes on the receiver, but I think he does a. I actually think he does a good job of coaching defensive backs. You know, even in those moments, you want to be looking for the ball and, and timing that right. So, again, I, and the big part of his philosophy on forcing throws deep and outside. So, I think he's willing to. Like I said, I think he's willing to live with some of those defensive pass interference penalties if you're not giving up an even bigger play um, or if you're just you get absolutely cooked so you know just take and obviously in the NFL it's different because uh, the defensive pass interference is, is officiated differently with the spot foul so that might be that might change um, 
but yeah, I think again, I think his biggest thing is playing fast and playing aggressive and not, he doesn't want to overload his players with information. So in case it's this one thing, we'll play it perfectly. It's like, no, we want to play, we want to get, we want to be right. We want to be mostly right most of the time. We don't want to be 100% right a very small percentage of the time and then get burned every other time. What about, uh, what about giving up big plays? Because with Joe Barry and with Mike Pettin, um before him, a, a big focus in Green Bay a lot of the time has been like, we're not going to give up the big plays. And then we're going to really hope, you know, sort of that the bend don't break, like death by a thousand cuts. We're going to try and force a turnover at some point on like a 12 play drive, but we're not going to give up the, 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 the deep shot. I'm not going to say it was always effective, but that was always the goal that they're working toward was first and foremost, don't give up any deep shots. Don't give up any broken plays. What was that like at BC? Were there big plays that were given up? You know, is that something the Packer fans are gonna have to learn to live with? Sort of like, hey, when you go from Aaron Rodgers, who never throws interceptions, to hey, we're gonna move on to any other quarterback, you're gonna have to learn to live with a few more interceptions than you had with Aaron Rodgers. So I'll say this. So during Halfley's tenure, BC allowed an explosive play rate. And when I say explosive play, I think that's defined as 12 yards or more. They allowed it on 13.3% of plays, which was the 24th most during college football from 2020 to 2023. Uh, their explosive pass play allowed rate was 15.9%, which was the 36th highest. And their explosive rush rate allowed was 11.3%, which was the 17th highest. So, yes, they do allow big plays. Um, and, again, I think his strategy is saying, especially with regarding to, to the pass plays, we want to make you make those big throws those big plays consistently by like making the perfect throw as opposed to hitting a guy and letting him work after the catch. Yeah. Um, and I think that the other side of this philosophy is because of how aggressive we're going to be with playing press and blitzing, we're going to try to create those explosives for the defense, whether it be a sack, a forced fumble or force the quarterback to make an errant throw and it's an interception. So, it's again kind of it's some of the results are probably the same as Joe Barry, but they're gonna uh, they're gonna appear in different ways. And uh, in terms of what you give up, like it's not gonna be you throw a uh, throw deep like short over the middle, and the guy just weaves his way for first down. It's gonna be down the field, and he makes a crazy catch between the defender and the sideline. It's like, well, there's no defense for a perfect throw. So, you know, it's kind of what what are you willing to stomach here? And it's weird sure. because they do allow these explosive plays, but BC has been pretty aggressive in terms of putting men in the box, you know, trying to stop the run. So during Halfley's tenure, uh, they had a heavy box, so seven or more defenders in the box on 22.8% of their plays, which is 29th in college football. Conversely, they use a light box, so uh, six or fewer defenders on 42.2% of plays, so nearly twice as much, but that was still the 118th most uh, usage of a light box. So in college football day where everybody's using light boxes, defense are spreading out about half. They're saying, no, we're still going to put defenders in the box to try to stop the run. Again, results are mixed, but there's a there's a philosoph philosophical through line there where it's you can kind of see how everything connects to the overarching vision of what they, what he wants to do and are are they good at defending the run because the packers have shown like hey we can go in and shut down pat mahomes or any elite passer that you want but then like the carolina panthers and the chicago bears like mm -hmm. they're going to just eat us up with yak and and you know just running uh, you know, getting six, seven yards of carry all day long. And like, you're frustrated watching this defense that feels like the opposing team can do whatever they want until a great passing attack shows up. And then that passing attack is nullified. Are we going to get more of an ability to stop the run when you have to with Jeff Halfley? I, I would say when you have to more so, yes, still not the best results. So during his tenure, okay. BC allowed 174.6 rushing yards per game, which was 105th during that time, so not very good. If you look at some more advanced statistics, so uh, defensive rushing success rate, so how often did the defense generate a successful play based on EPA? 56.2% uh, of the time, which was 99th, so a little higher. And they had a negative 0.2 defensive EPA per designed rush, which was 101st. So not great, but the problem with where BC is in college football is the opponents are so varied. So, 
you know, one week you'll play a G5 team and the next week you'll play Clemson or something. And there were definitely games where BC was very solid at defending the run. And also considered, yeah, and this kind of goes both ways where in college, um, rushing yards are, are sacks are rushing yards for quarterbacks. And obviously a lot of quarterbacks are going to run more. And there were some quarterbacks, uh, especially in 2020. One, I think, 2022, a little bit same way. They really struggled to defend like true running quarterbacks. So uh, Malik Cunningham from Louisville, who is kind of like a poor man's Lamar Jackson, if you will. Um, so they struggled some with some of those guys, but I think that's kind of just an athleticism issue. Um, <clears throat> so talk about that athleticism, like how much, how much emphasis would you put or, or blame, I guess, um, would you put on defensive failures being, schematic and teaching versus like, Hey, love these kids, but it's Boston college. Like how much can you expect from, from Boston college players? I think, I think that's a good, I think that's a important piece of the puzzle because again, like, and to Halfley's credit, um, in his first three, two years against Clemson, they took Clemson to the wire, uh, in 2020, they, I think they only lost by four, on the road, they played both the first two games were on the road. So it was in Clemson 2020. Uh, they I think they lost by four, and then the next year, and then in Clemson, Clemson again and made the playoffs. Yes, and then in 2021, uh, I think they, they yeah, let me see, I think they lost by three, and they they had a chance to win it at the very end, and that was at Clemson at night. So, you know, they've they've held their own against Clemson. Florida State has been a bit more of an issue. Um, they've really just gotten out athleted in most of those games this past year, not so much. But from what I've heard, flu, uh, Florida State had the flu that game, so they were down bad. And also, that's BC's red bandana game, which if you have if you know anything about BC or college football, you know a little about that. It's a cool story that BC always gets this kind of magic bump when they play with the red bandana uniforms. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, but and I would say like the, it's tough because the last two years have been weird where they've had these very inconsistent results. And in 20, in 2022, the offense was just so bad that the defense was very frequently put in bad positions. So it's, it's hard to really blame or tell how bad the defense really was because the offense was just three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out for the entire, you know, usually like the first three quarters of game. So they just had no rest, no opportunity to make adjustments or, just you know, have a moment to breathe. So that's another part of it. Um, but I, I do think that a lot of the issues with this defense were more about um, the opponents having superior talent. And I think at the, uh, you can obviously like, okay, opponents know what BC is going to do. So they are maybe better equipped to attack it because they kind of know BC's overall schematic tendencies, which again, I think in later in Halfway Center, we saw some more diversity, some more adjustments, but I think a big thing about it is the BC defense is going to force you to execute consistently. And I would say in both the run and pass game and in college, when you don't have equal talent, that's going to be a problem. And in the NFL where you, I would say generally on a week to week basis, you're, you're competing with teams that are on the same talent level as you, you know, maybe one week you play the chiefs or the Ravens the next week you play the commanders or the Panthers, you know, just depending on what it is, but for the most part, you're going to be playing similar teams. And so the, I think that that, that defensive scheme can produce better results in the NFL with equal talent going up against each other every week. Can you describe your, um, your assessment of the defensive line and the defensive line philosophy? Um, what is sort of the, What's sort of the trade off with the with the relationship between the interior and the edge um guys on the defensive line? You know, it is is that something that they're intentionally trying to scheme up like interior pressure um it, it, it in mm-hmm. any kind of a different or unique way, uh like we saw at Ohio State. Sure. Um that's interesting. I think obviously the differences between Barry's, you know, three, four odd fronts moving to Halfley's more four, three, even fronts. Um, I say this and so I'm not sure how schematically nerdy your audience is, but so an odd front is when there are three down defensive linemen. And I say down their hand is in the dirt. They're usually the bigger guys. And usually the odd front is the three defense interior defensive linemen are head up over the center and the two tackles in an even front. There's four down defensive linemen, so four defenders with their hand in the dirt, and they're usually more 
in the gaps or in the case of the defensive ends on the outside. Um, Halfley generally let, leans more towards over fronts. So you set the three tech or the, the B gap defensive tackle between the guard and the tackle. He is set to the side of the offense's run strength. The one tech or nose tackle is set in the A gap between the center and the guard away from the offense's run strength. Mm-hmm. No. Yes, away from the offense's run strength. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would say generally those, the defensive tackle positions are pretty traditionally sized. Like this year they had kind of a weird thing, but there isn't like one super undersized defensive tackle. I would say that over his tenure at BC, the defensive ends have been usually a little undersized, but I think that's more of just a result of who we can recruit because we know his guys at Ohio State were, at, were freaks, like Chase Young, Zach Harrison, Jante Jean-Baptiste, like guys who are just huge. And I think that that, that transition for guys like Rashawn Gary, uh, Kingsley and Ibarre, I'd not sure up Preston Smith because I think he's more of a true three, four outside linebacker. I think this is very good for Lucas Van Ness, though. I think this is a good yeah. transition for him. Sure. Um, and then I think I think Kenny I think this you know Kenny Clark and Daryl Slayton will play the nose tackle, Devontae Wyatt, and um, probably need to find another three tech defensive tackle who's more in that traditional defensive tackle mold. But okay. that works fine for them in terms of designing pressures and such. That's something where I think Halfley does very does excel just, just despite having a defensive back background and maybe this is some other player people on his staff but they do a lot of very unique exotic designer pressures with loot if you so i post i had an article for bc uh after their fenway bowl win where they ran this same six-man pressure which uh had like slants and loops and everything and they ran it six times each time was on like third or fourth down and long and every time they got pretty much they got the result they wanted. So they they forced pressure on pressure every time. It, the one the two times there was a positive result was there was an offsides on the defense and the quarterback got tr- like a player reached out and like got his leg at the line of scrimmage and he fell forward on third down to force fourth and short. So succeeded every time and the SMU really had no answers for it. And in 2022, they did a lot of very interesting stuff out of a 3-3-5 formation where they would blitz the linebackers and loop all around. So I think he is very creative and aggressive with these third down blitz looks to uh, get guys in advantageous situations that confuse the offense. Um, and again, I know I said like he has a traditional way of setting the uh, setting the defensive front, but having talked to him, like they, he is very intentional about not setting the front in such a way that the defense can key on it in that like okay normally they set the front toward the run strength you know that's not gonna be that way all the time like sometimes they'll set it to whether they're on the field or the boundary side of the field obviously that's less of a thing in the nfl because the hashes are so much closer together uh sometimes they'll set it uh depending on where the running back is in relation to the quarterback is he right behind him in pistol or under center? Is he on the left side or the right side in shotgun? Um, is there a second back in the backfield that could change it? So he has been very intentional about not having just, okay, these are our rules for how we set our front and we don't change them. Like there's always little adjustments that they can make and they can slide or slant the defensive line based on what they want to do to confuse the offense. We are trying to figure out, and I loved your familiarity with the Packers defensive line, name dropping every single guy. I'm like a, I have like a super draft person. So like I like for the last like 10, 15 years, like I, well, especially like the last like five, I like know just a bunch of names that like, I don't really need to know because there's probably, I could probably use the brain space on, you know, things in my (laughs) real normal life. (laughs) Well, I appreciate your familiarity with our defensive line. We are trying to figure out if we need to bring anybody, if if the Packers are going to bring in anybody at linebacker to make sure that we have all the horses that Jeff is going to need. And then, you know, our secondary right now seems to be missing a lot of pieces. So we we anticipate that they're going to really focus heavily there in the draft. Um, Do you know of any uh, positions in the middle of the field, um, in the secondary that you think are really key to um, making sure that Jeff can, can execute everything he wants schematically. So I think in an ideal world, he would have two safeties that can rotate um, competently between playing free safety, playing the slot and playing more of a strong safety role in the box. Um, Obviously with single high, you're going to have that normal free safety. That is just your, 
you know, center fielder in the back. And I think he's fine with that, especially if, if you have a competent slot corner. But I think he would like to have that where he can really rotate between those two guys. So he can even line up in a too high shell with both safeties back and then rotate them down and try to confuse the offense that way. But I, and also, I think you could argue every defense, every defensive coordinator, regardless of scheme, would prefer that. Yeah. Um, that said, I think that the, still the free safety guy that can also transition a slot is very important. Um, before this past year, it was Jason Matry who transferred to, to Wisconsin this year. And maybe some of your fans are Wisconsin fans and they know Jason Matry. Who, him, yeah. <laughs> so he is a, he's a very fun player because he's like 5'9", 180. But when he plays in the slot and blitzes, he is coming with a vengeance. Like he, like, like there were a few times where he, when they would play Clemson, he would blitz and knock DJ Uyangale, who's half a foot and, 60 pounds, everything, maybe just knock him on his butt. So plays really hard, uh, plays well against the run, but can also be your slot cover guy and play deep. So that's an interesting role. And that's that's a role where I, well, I guess that role where you can do both. In terms of the true slot player, I do think Darnell Savage would be very effective as Halfley's slot guy because he does like to blitz that position a lot. Uh, okay. You know, he's important in the run fit, uh, but obviously still can just cover guys well out of the slot. So I, I think that that would be a good transition for Darnell Savage. Um, probably need to kind of remake the safety room as a whole if you're going to move Savage into the slot. Um, you're not telling us anything we don't know. We, yeah. <laughs> we, um, we need some help with safety. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of it is it is what it is there. Um, you know, just need bodies there in terms of cornerback. I mean, if you're keeping Jair Alexander around, he's a great cornerback, and I'm sure Halfley would love to work he's with him. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think he would like Eric Stokes as kind of his new Elijah Jones, where he has that tall, lanky, very athletic corner that can take out the backside. Um, yeah, so I think – and then I'm trying to think of – linebackers are tough because I, I think most BC fans would agree that's been the area that has struggled the most since Halfley has come in. Um okay. And I think that that I think of I think BC fans overweight that because so much of football in general, and I would say college even more so in the NFL, is all about just targeting linebackers in space and having plays that just make them wrong no matter what they do. And obviously, yeah. BC's BC's linebackers are usually going to be like I mentioned with Vinny De Palma are usually going to be subpar athletes or pretty much like the rest of the linebacker room are converted safeties. So they would have some trouble making those communications, making those adjustments. Um, so maybe not fair to, to judge the linebacker play at BC um, because they just didn't have the horses that like, yeah. And again, like just kind of the general, and I, I mean, linebacker play in general is so hard. Like, I mean, if you think about linebacker play today, even in the NFL, like there's three or four guys who are really good and everybody else is just like, eh. like you got Fred Warner, Roquan Smith, um, and like that's it. <laughs> like, like how like you can't really name many other true like off ball linebackers that are playing there all the time. You're like, that's a guy I can trust to do anything. It's like no, there's like those two, and then everybody else has their weaknesses. Matt Matt, uh, Matt Milano from Buffalo, of course, who's a Boston College alum, uh, but he broke his. I always forget because he broke his leg this season. But you know, that's a, that's just a problem in the NFL today is that there's not enough good linebackers, and that was a problem at BC. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that the linebacker he's the linebackers are not asked to do anything particularly special. Like there isn't okay. um there isn't like an on ball Sam that is, you know, also a pass rusher. There isn't this like uh, an off ball Sam that's like also the slot defender. They're they're mostly kind of just in the box. They cover some of the running backs and tight ends a bit. Um yeah, so I'd say they they were never really asked to do anything super crazy. Anything right, that awesome. any other defense would ask the linebackers to do. So, you know, I think that that's it's kind of made them replaceable. And when you, if you think about those Ohio State teams, when you have three linebackers that are future NFL players, plus tough Borland, who, you know, great college player. <laughs> Basically, as, as an Ohio State fan, Vinny De Palma was our tough Borland. So, you know, if you imagine him trying to cover a receiver like Devonta Smith in space, there's going to be issues. <laughs> makes makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. I'm going to let you get out of here. Can you talk to me about Jeff Halfley's personality, sort of the man himself that we're going to get to know and with a special focus on what you think he is like around the players, what, what kind of personality um, they are working with and what just what makes him special, you know, in that human relationship as a coach. 
So again, I'll say that the, the him leaving so abruptly was so difficult to process because, and for me personally, because I really liked him. Um, You've called it a betrayal a couple times now that he's, yes, he's yes, to go to the Packers. Yeah, well, and not about the Packers, just about leaving BC at this point in the in the timeline of college football when they had just put together a very good transfer portal class. There was optimism yeah. going into this upcoming season after a, the bull win. So to have it happen just kind of out of nowhere was just so shocking and, and frustrating because I do really like the guy and I totally understand why he did what he did in terms of wanting to be a true ball coach. The fact that he's probably getting paid about the same that he was at BC, but he has to do about 50% of the work and it's all football. It's none of the other stuff. And he's also, whatever he's getting paid goes a lot further in Green Bay than it does in Boston. So I, I totally get it. Um, but he is a very good communicator, a very, again, very positive person. He wants to get everybody to get to their best as a player. And he's not, like, he's not a disciplinarian, but he's not, he's not going to be like a screaming at your face. Like you're doing this wrong. Like you suck. Like he's going to be like, Hey, like this is what you're doing wrong. Like let's like, we got to fix it. Like, you know, you can do this. Like, I know you can do this. Like he is going to like overwhelm you with like love and positivity and be like, I, I know you can do this and like try to get you to be motivated that way. And he's going to prepare, he's going to prepare like hell. He's going to get you all the tools you need to make sure that you can be successful. So it's, he's essentially giving everything he can to the players such that it's basically up to them. It's like, how good do you want to be? I'm going to give you everything I have. If you do the same, you're going to be a great player. And I would say that's his philosophy towards coaching and teaching and building up players. All right, he is. Oh Mitch wait, Wolf. one more thing. He's also a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. That's that's like the one big thing about his person because he's from New Jersey. Like that's his, he is a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. That's that's the one. That's like one of the few things we really know about his like personal life background. That's his, that's one thing I should I should note. It's been a couple of years uh, since this was a thing, but I remember there were a lot of articles written for a while there about the Packers needing to modernize the music they were playing at practice <laughs> because uh i don't know like the coaches had like you know old-fashioned taste and the the players were like sick of it and wanted some some new stuff so uh we'll, we'll see uh we'll, i will say like it, for some reason bc would like when they would have practice reports they would report like the first song of the day and it was usually something more modern for the players so i think he's able to sub i think i think what i've heard is he gets like one song of practice one springsteen okay. song he can add a practice so you know he, he's able to sublimate his own desires so that the players can have what they want <laughs> Could be an effective uh, discipline tactic of like, yeah. Hey, listen, you know, if you <laughs> you guys are again, slacking, I'm we're doing all of uh, all of born I'm in the USA DJ. today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Mitch, for your time. Appreciate you so much. Uh, he is Mitch Wolf, staff writer for Eagles Insider. Follow him on Twitter at Mitchell T Wolf with an E, and read Eagles Insider on the Two Four Seven Sports Network.